um, reading difficulties as part of our advancing learning program, okay? And reading difficulties in connection with them, special educational needs. Uh, when we talk about difficulties, we know that we are aiming at inclusion and we very often think about pathologies. But the truth is that beyond pathologies, uh, very often we have cases of children or students in general who present different kinds of difficulties. Have you ever stopped to think why reading comprehension and the teaching of reading comprehension is so difficult? No need to answer, just think. Um, there are many factors, many factors involved. But at the same time, it's essential to teach reading comprehension. And reading is a skill. We are not born with the skill. We are born with the capacity to learn. So we as educators, as teachers of English, we have to develop this skill. Uh, why do you think English is so important? Why do you think reading comprehension is included in all books by all publishers? Think for a while. No need to tell. Reading is essential for different reasons. First of all, it integrates all aspects of language. It integrates grammar and vocabulary. If you read aloud, if you practice reading aloud in the classroom, you include pronunciation and intonation, fluency. It improves all aspects of language and language learning in general. At the same time, it creates a virtuous circle because the moment the students feel pleased and the, mo the moment the students discover they can read and understand, they want to be upgraded. They want to start reading something a little bit more difficult and gradually they begin to enjoy reading. Nobody will enjoy reading if they don't understand what they read. So that is the first thing we have to bear in mind. We have to guarantee they understand in general terms at least. Uh, we know that many students, perhaps not 100%, but would want to read something in English, but things like Harry Potter or the, ha the Hunger Games, things that are impossible at the beginning. So in a way, when we teach reading comprehension gradually, and when we aim higher and higher, what we are doing is helping students aim gradually at more extensive reading. But basically, and I think that this is the most important thing, it's for their entire life. Reading and reading comprehension, when you teach reading comprehension, it's for everything and it's forever, okay? But we must admit that it's not easy at all. It is a very complex uh, skill and it's complex because it involves different sub-skills or skills. Uh, when we think of reading, we can think of reading a page, we can think of reading a short paragraph, we can think of reading aloud, we can think of reading just words, we can think of reading expressively. So, depending how we take that reading, it will imply decoding skills and comprehension skills of different types. When some of these skills fail, the reading comprehension in general fails. So reading is not easy at all because it involves different processes and different kinds of processes. It's true that there are basic processes and that is in general what we cover. This is in general what we pay attention to. This is in general what we have in most books. Processes that involve the integration of vocabulary and grammar basically at a surface structure level. At a more advanced level, we can make students think a little bit more. When we want to think a little bit more, that more has also got limitations. But when you do real reading comprehension in a critical way, then we involve higher level processes, thinking processes that are much more demanding and much more complex. These processes have to do with pragmatics. They have to do not only with the word and the sentence, but with what is implied in a certain context by the word and the sentence. And what is implied and what is understood very often depends on the context, first of all, 
but also on the background knowledge and on our personal experience and experiences in the program. So this is why it's not so easy, because I can control the grammar and vocabulary. I can easily limit and control the surface structure level of my texts so that my students can understand. But then I cannot control their own background. I cannot control their own experiences. So basically, there are many factors at play. It's a complex skill. On the one hand, there are writing conventions, and uh, it's not easy. Then, of course, grammar and vocabulary, background knowledge, and also metacognitive structures. Because it is complex, then what do we do? We play safe. We play safe, and we do this. Let's read the rectangle that you have in gray at the bottom of my slide. Uh, I'm sure there are many words that you don't know, but because of your background knowledge, because of your metacognitive knowledge and strategies, you can more or less think, for example, how you can pronounce these words. Let's take the second word. How would you pronounce it? Probably palgesh or foldesh. What about the third one? It's flexa. There's not much about it. And what about the verb with ing? It may be sputting or sputting. You don't know the meaning. But I can ask you, what is the flexor like? Or what was the flexor like? And probably you will say, Polish or Pan. And uh, what was the flexor doing? Everybody will focus on the ing, and you will say, putting or starting. I can even ask, where? I grant the book. And what did you do? I placed him. This is what we do with our students. What we do with our students when we are not actually doing real reading comprehension. When we are doing a kind of reading comprehension that in a way is a lie, because we are not checking if they understand or not, because these words don't exist. So we answered the flexor was Polish, but we don't understand what it means, because these words don't exist. So, however, the student got a 10. So what happens if a student doesn't get to that level? What happens when a student can't understand this? Well, the others have not understood it either, and they got a 10. So you see that reading is much more complex than it really seems. And our task as teachers is, in a way, to assess what we really want to assess. So when we are dealing with reading comprehension, then we should separate grammar correspondence from real reading comprehension. OK? So let's go to a very clear example. Imagine I say this. OK? Imagine I say this. The bus ended up in the hedge. Several passengers were hurt. The driver was questioned. Let's start with the beginning. I mean, the bus ended up in the hedge. Which of the three pictures would you identify this text with? Number one, number two, or number three? If you know the word hedge, you would say, well, in the first one, there is no hedge. In the second one, there is a hedge. Good, you're all answering two. Well done. Now, wait a minute. In the second one, there is a hedge. And in the third one, there is no hedge, just a, a bush. However, number two is more likely to be a coach than a bus, because it's a double-decker. So the answer would be none. Now, several passengers were heard. And how can we connect the first sentence? Yes, you're right, OK. How would you connect the first sentence with the second sentence? Now, now we need our previous experience because we know that buses should go on the road, not along hedges. So this is why several passengers were hurt because there was an accident. Otherwise, this would make no sense. Now, again, the driver was questioned implies that somebody called the police. And so the police are there. 
all this comes not from the meaning of the words, it comes from the context and from our previous knowledge. Now let's go on and discover more things. In the same text, I can go on and say, then she was congratulated. Wow. And when we talk about reference, some students may say, and who is she? Well, she is the driver. The point is that in Argentina, there are not many female drivers. So you see how this has to do with the way our brain works. It has to do with what we call our schema, the connections we make. Sadly, yes, you're right, Gabi. Hello, Gabi. So um, there are a few drivers that are women, but not many. And then another, um, another difficult situation. How come she was congratulated if she had an accident? Well, on her skillful handling of the bus when the brakes failed. It was not her fault, although many men may they say, may think it was her fault. You see how? Hello, hello, Noemi. Uh, no, Noemi, welcome. Okay, so. Um, you see how many things are involved in reading. Now you know why reading is not easy at all. And of course it's true that we have to revise grammar and vocabulary regularly, uh, perhaps in the warm-up and in the relaxation and constantly all the time, so that we guarantee at least one part, the part that is surface structure. But then we must develop critical thinking. And this we have to make a point of all the time. You have to develop critical thinking every time you are in class. How? Let's go on. Let's take this short text. It's about really unusual animals. All right. Um, of course, everybody would read it. You would perhaps play the CD or play the audio material. And then in the same book, you've got at the bottom activity number six, read again and listen and then answer the questions okay fine but we are not going critical if i just read or make the students read and answer the questions i'm not teaching them critical thinking i'm not going beyond the test there is a part that i am leaving aside, and that part that i'm leaving aside first of all has to start from the title why are these animals unusual? What characteristic that is mentioned in the text makes each of the three animals unusual? I've got only one thing, one aspect that is critical thinking, and that is the fact that there are four pictures and three texts. So the children have to choose which pictures correspond to each of the three texts, and that is critical thinking. Every time we choose, we discriminate, then that is critical thinking. But then I have to go on, okay? So how do we go on? One way of going on and one simple way of um, developing critical thinking is to transform the text, the text into an email, the text into a poem, the text into a chart. So for example, in this very simple case, because this is faces number one, uh, one very simple thing you can do is, okay, let's draw a comparative chart. You've got the three animals, you've got the chameleon, the tarsier, and the peacock spider. And then we can have, for example, location, abilities, or location, description, and abilities. Okay? So in, the, in this way, they are transforming information. And once they have the chart, then I can use the chart to make them speak about each of the animals and compare the three animals orally. So by going round and round the same information, the same material, with the same language, what I'm doing is giving them a hand to speak and to understand what they read and to remember what they read. Or uh, I can make the students, I use that book, okay, hello Romina, thank you for joining us, nice comments, good. Um, and then um, another simple thing we can do is to teach the students to create their own true, false, or not mentioned activities, but transforming information again. For example, it says that Tarsiers have got huge eyes. A good sentence would be, they haven't got small eyes. Students will have to think about meaning. And then they would have to think about the negative 
that is critical thinking, okay? But everything starts from the title. There is always an association between the title and the text, and we have to teach that to begin with, and then start working on the text, okay? So these are very simple uh, examples of going beyond and simple examples that show the complexity of reading comprehension. This is another one for older children and a little bit more advanced children. It's a, tr a true story. It's about a man who was a millionaire and he invited all his friends to his mansion. And um, he went on a tour of his mansion showing them everything. And he said then to, to promise to give them money to uh, somebody who could swim across the swimming pool. Then at that moment, they heard a splash and a loud noise, and they saw that the man's lawyer was in the swimming pool and was, in fact, swimming across the swimming pool, trying to get out of it, but because he was swimming with crocodiles. And when he came out, the millionaire asked him, well, okay, you did it. You, sw you swam across the swimming pool and out of it. Now, what is it that you want? Instead of saying, I want all the money, he just said, I want to know who pushed me. So, of course you can have questions and answers. Of course you can have true or false. But again, transforming or going on or adding is important. So we can add feelings, okay? So this Patrick Hughes, who was a millionaire, received his friends. How did he feel? Let's add a sentence. Or the man who was pushed into the swimming pool, when he said, I want to know who pushed me, add a sentence explaining how he said that, how he felt at that moment. Add another ending to the story. Add yourselves in the story. You are a character. The child is a character. Just one or two sentences saying who you are, what you did at that moment. Or, this is just a, a newspaper article. We can transform it, for example, by telling the children to act out the tour of the mansion. Uh, to act out the tour of the mansion, they need to understand what a mansion is. They need to understand the fact that, the fact that Patrick was a millionaire and the fact that Patrick, the, the millionaire, was a bit of a show off. He wanted to show off in front of all his uh, colleagues or friends. So because he was a show off, he would speak in a certain way and he would show them certain things. That is real reading comprehension, much more than who is a millionaire? Well, here it says Patrick Hughes is. That is grammar. Okay? That is sentence structure. I'm not challenging my students. And of course, if I don't challenge them enough, if I don't pitch my activities high enough, they are not going to uh, have fun. Okay, great. Here Romina says we can make a comic out of the text. Fantastic, fantastic. And we can go a step forward, you know? We can invite different students to react the way they want. So they have to react, and they have to react in English, but they can react the way they like. Somebody may make a video of that tour of the house, and they would, they would have great fun. Others may make a comic. Others just may summarize the text in two or three sentences or two or three pictures, but that's it. But when each group or each student reacts his or her own way, we are adding, we have reading comprehension, but we are adding creativity. And that is something that we can all do. And it's um, economical because we don't have to spend any money on anything. Okay? So remember to always go beyond the uh, the conclusion of this first part is that, as you can see, if you work in this way, um, maybe they could act it out. Yes, of course, yes, they could. To act it out, and I go back to the previous, uh, give me a second, please. Okay, I go back. If they want to act all this out, uh, be careful with the part where somebody pushes the man into the swimming pool. We don't want any accidents uh, at school. Okay, avoid that part. But it could be, and it could be great fun for sure. Um, okay, thank you, everybody. Right. Uh, so, um, after here, just a few examples to show you that reading comprehension is not easy at all because you have to consider diversity. Uh, I'm not talking about pathologies, I'm talking about 20 or 30 different people, different individuals who have their own 
um, backgrounds, their own preferences, their own everything. So of course, not everybody is going to enjoy acting now. Not everybody is going to jump to enjoy making a video. Not everybody is going to enjoy creating a, a poem. Okay, but that's the good thing about it. That we are all different. So now we come to the second part, and that is the bridge between the difficulties in reading comprehension and what we call special educational needs. And when I say special educational needs, very often we associate it with pathologists like dyslexia, ADHD, okay. These are labels, and they are not very good, and they are not useful at all, because they don't help us at all. And above all, they don't help students at all. On the contrary, on the contrary. So, um, special educational needs. I can tell you that we are all special in some way. Can you think of one way in which you are special? Right now, I can tell you I'm special because um, I'm very grateful. I do what I want. I love this job. I'm here talking to more than 100 people, and not everybody has that pleasure. It's the evening. It's late. So I'm special. I'm special because I have a lovely family, a husband I love, and four children that I adore. I'm special in that way. Special need not be a bad, or need not, need not have a bad connotation. The word special is and should be positive. We are all special in some way. Great. I like your comments. I'm special because I have great co-workers. We can all look for reasons why we are special, I can assure you. So thinking of special needs as something bad is the first one. And uh, labeling, uh, saying, well, I've got four dyslexic children. And the other teacher says, well, I've got five ADD. You, you don't know how difficult it is. Well, this is just labeling. It doesn't solve anything. We should have, okay, let's read this. I'm special because I have fun. That's great. Um, my dictionary is giving me a hard time. Okay, I'm special because I love laughing with my students. We're all special in some way, either professionally, privately, even in your sports life. I don't know. We are all special. So um, what I mean is let's not use the term special as something negative because it is not. And let's avoid labels because we are not those professionals who should diagnose. Um, to begin with, it's not easy to diagnose, but let's get started. I think uh, that we should learn a few things about reading comprehension problems. Okay. First of all, you've got a picture there, a sort of purple, bluish picture. That's the picture of a book. It's a photo of a book that is the DSM uh, 4, 5, 1, 2, up to number 5. Now we have them available. In Argentina, we use number 4 mainly. Number 5 is the new one. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Mental disorders, hard as it may sound. In this manual, used by psychiatrists, uh, we have a long list of all the possible pathologies, including learning disorders. And within those learning disorders, we have the Okay, I go on receiving messages. Great. Okay, we are all very special. So this is a very special group. Thanks. Uh, so it doesn't sound nice at all to have a manual of these disorders, which are mental disorders. And this manual is used by psychiatrists. Let's change our position. Imagine we are parents and our children are special, but special in this pathological way. How would we react if we had a child with Down syndrome, a child who has been diagnosed with dyslexia, a child who is described as ADD? It wouldn't be nice, would it? So we have to start changing our point of view. On the one hand, we don't know this manual. Uh, this manual has a long list of symptoms, and the child needs a certain number of these 
symptoms, plus the fact that he needs to show these symptoms in at least three different environments. The only, the, the only environment that I, or where I work with the students is my classroom and the school. So I cannot say whether he is dyslexic or not. The only thing I can say is that, well, to me, he's got a, some special signs. We speak about signs. Okay. Uh, another thing is that very often when I say the word dyslexia, we associate it automatically with reading trouble, reading disabilities. But it's much more than just reading. For example, uh, very often dyslexic children don't crawl when they are babies, they just walk. Very often they learn to walk either too soon or too late. Very often when they are in kinder and they have to march to the rhythm of certain, you know, certain song, they just cannot. Or when they have to clap to syllables, they just cannot. They cannot find rhyming words. So it's not only that they cannot read. It's not only that they find it difficult to read. It's much more. On the one hand, yes, it's true that they have some trouble reading because their reading is inaccurate, it's very slow, and if they make an effort to read, and very often the, the effort you can see it because they go, but then they cannot understand. Apart from that, uh, the reading and their spelling is inconsistent. Inconsistent means that there are no rules. That is, that's another mistake. We very often say, well, yes, dyslexic people cannot distinguish between D and P or P and B because they are round, they are similar. Well, but this is not always the case. Sometimes, depending on their emotions, it says chair and they will read hair. But sometimes it says chair and they can read table. How come? There's no connection between table and chair. Well, it has to do with how they feel. Feelings, emotions are uh, very closely related to all this. And I've got a question here. Do you think we should correct their spelling mistakes? Okay, this is a very interesting question, Flavia. Uh, there are moments. There are moments. Uh, there are moments and there are ways. I think you have to correct uh, because if not, you are letting them do just whatever. It depends also on the age. If they are first or second grade or third grade, it's one thing. If they are in secondary school, it's another thing because this dyslexia, the same as ADD, the same as several other pathologies, they are not cured. You are dyslexic and you are forever. So, if you have a, a child who has all these signs or symptoms, or maybe you have a diagnosis, you know he's dyslexic because he goes to a, an educational therapist or a psychologist and you know he's dyslexic, then at a certain point, yes, you have to correct, but correcting positively, underlining some things, asking them, we will see all this a little bit later, asking them to write and if possible using the computer, leaving a line in, in between in bigger fonts so that you've got enough space where to write comments and always, always give them oral feedback. If they find it difficult to read, imagine how difficult they will find to read your corrections. So yes, you have to correct, but we have to look for a way. And the way is always nicely, always positively. Okay, the way is the most important point. I agree with you, Ravi. So going back, spelling is inconsistent and technically it has to do with emotions. The emotions are technically called boosters. A booster is something, anything. Maybe your parents are getting divorced, maybe you quarreled with your boyfriend, maybe there was a car crash near your house and you were like shocked. That is going to make you feel uncomfortable and read in a worse way. Um, Laurita says, I've got students with dyslexia and my methodology went test of course, very good, Laura, go ahead. Yes, we will see a few strategies in a few minutes, okay? And when it comes to writing, uh, of course, their speed is very low. 
because sometimes they cannot draw letters. Uh, sometimes they cannot, if they are paying attention to writing and to forming words, because these people, there are different kinds of dyslexia, but very often it works at the brain level. And for them, uh, where the, the word finishes and another, another word begins, they just don't see that, uh, that stop. For them, the word can go on. If I have to write the chair, the, for them, may finish in the C or in the A. It's exactly the same. Um, a few minutes ago, I, I attended a conference by a very, very important uh, lecturer, Ruth Harp is her name, and uh, I didn't know uh, she's dyslexic. And she was telling us, she's an expert in pedagogy, in psychology, and she gives lectures on inclusive uh, classrooms. And uh, she was telling us that to arrive at the place, the place was on a certain street, number 743. She had to write the name big on a sheet of paper because for her, 743 is the same as 437, 347. For her, it looks exactly the same. And she is a genius. So this has nothing to do with intelligence. This is a practical thing. So if they write, they have to pay a lot of attention to where one word finishes and another word ends because they just cannot see it. And of course, if they concentrate on that, they cannot think about contents. And if they think about content and writing, they will find it very hard to organize their ideas because they find it hard to organize everything, to organize their clothes, to organize their thoughts, because everything is messy to them. So, um, if you put this together with all the reading comprehension difficulties, you will see that it's not easy at all. So let's pause it here. Uh, we always have to think of the things we can do, of the things they can do. I was telling you we are special. We are all special in some way. Let's make them special in a positive. Let's make ourselves special teachers in this way, the way we help other students um, feel welcome in the classroom, feel that somebody cares. Because very often, many teachers, unfortunately, get fed up. Many teachers criticize them. Many teachers say, well, they need another professional, not me. So first of all, the best way to help them, whether you teach English, geography, or physics, the first picture shows two roads, two roads that are different but go parallel. This, I think, is the key to it all. You have to remember that these children need special work all the time. They need accommodations. They need a bigger font. They need segmentation of their work. They need a lot of attention. They need, but at the same time, because this is forever, because this is not cured, as educators, we need to prepare them for real life. So every now and then, we have to give them the chance to feel challenged, to go to the other road that is the real life road. So we have two roads. When we assess, and here comes the second word, assessment, that is the main point. When we, how do we assess them? What, and more than assessment, marking. Is an aid the same as an aid for another student? No, it's, it's not, definitely not. And we have to make everybody understand this. And we need the support from the, uh, the heads of the school or the institution. So when we assess more than ever, we have to pay attention to the red road, that is helping them, segmenting tasks, having these children near us, paying attention to their needs, to guarantee that they don't feel just frustrated. When we are not assessing, when we are not giving them a mark, let's pitch higher, let's challenge them, let's help them do more or less what the others do. Of course, this will depend on how many hours you have, this will depend on how many students you have, this will depend on how they feel that day, because maybe they've had a bad day and they just cannot cope with it but let's keep our eyes open. Basically, the things that um, we can do and the things that are economical, 
special forms. Uh, there are special forms for dyslexic people. Uh, you can Google them, they are free, you can download the program. If you know somebody who is a computer programmer, they can even create a form for that child. Uh, Carlitos font, the name of the student, or Susanita's font. A programmer can do that. But if not, it doesn't matter. Use Verdana or Times New Roman number 14 font. It has to be big and clear. Line, uh, uh, an empty line in between. These children also need a special place in the classroom, which is not at my desk. It's not first row, it's second line near me but not separated from the rest because if not i am also discriminating i am also segregating i am also showing that they are special in a negative way and they need more time more time may uh, maybe for example um fewer activities in the same time more time maybe more time during the break that is i start in my lesson but when the lesson finishes maybe they want to stay Yes, here Gabriela says they need to feel they are achieving different goals. They need to feel praised by their teachers. Yes, uh, they need to remember that very often, and that's another thing, dyslexia accompanies other things. Very often ADD also comes with dyslexia. So very often these children may be a problem in the classroom. Uh, and so they are regarded as, you know, difficult, not nice, unpleasant. So the moment we, we transmit that we care, we transmit that we are there to embrace them, to hug them, not physically. We embrace when we make them sit near us. We embrace a child by looking at him in a special way. We embrace a child when we pass on his shoulder. We embrace, a, we embrace a child when we say, well done today, look, you've underlined everything. Or you remember to use capital letters, congratulations. We embrace when we celebrate every little thing he's able to do. We embrace when we celebrate small successes, okay? So more time is more time for the student and more time to celebrate and more time for me, more dedication, more planning. Color is another strategy. Uh, you may try printing things in different colors. It helps. But also using a color sheet of paper to glue. We very often use photocopies. We have to make everything bigger and we have to segment tasks. So very often we use photocopies or we print things on the internet. Okay, so that photocopy, you glue it on to a color sheet of paper. And so the color becomes a frame around the photocopy. That frame helps the child to focus. Now you will say, what color, Ali? Um, I'm sorry, you have to discover that because the color is first. Maybe red works for one student, but blue works better for another and yellow for another. In general, blue is the best one, but it depends. Uh, the reason, reading window, I will show it in a minute, Segmentation means one task at a time. Segmentation means cutting out the activities. It means separating one exercise from another when every book has got three or four or five exercises per page. They just cannot go. It has to be one at a time. So what do I do with the others? You can cut them. And if possible, you have to make the one you are using bigger. Segmentation also means more than four sentences is just too much. Sometimes there are exercises in books, in workbooks, in tests that have got five, six, seven, ten sentences. They just cannot count. Uh, segmentation also means if there are many pictures on the page and pictures are good and necessary, well, then the pictures have to be dealt with before and on a separate sheet of paper or covered all the rest. It's one thing at a time. Especially remember that ADD very often comes with dyslexia. So all that information, the pictures, the colors, the sentences, is just too much. 
When it comes to assessment and to giving a mark, of course, more recognition than production is recommendable if you want to be positive. If you're going to ask them to write a composition, and we know that they just kind of write two sentences, you are just being illogical. Your demands are too high, and we know that they are going to fail. So then the assessment becomes negative rather than positive. Of course, they need more work. Up to here, any questions? Uh, at the end, I'm going to show you my personal email, and I've got a Facebook account, so maybe you want to contact me to discuss a personal case or a situation, okay? So far, so good. All right, fine. So uh, anyway, we can keep in touch, and we can discuss private cases, but not here. These are generalities, all right? Go So let's go on. These are concrete objects that we can use to help our children. The first one, black and white, that is the reading window. The reading window, we can make it ourselves. We can ask the student to make it. It's a piece of uh, cardboard or uh, construction paper. And we cut a hole in the middle, a rectangular hole. And so when we put the window on the text, in that uh, white rectangle, we will have the letter. So the, the window becomes like a frame for the text. And as the child reads, moving the window to the right, he will focus only on the two or three words that appear in the white part. Okay? This is just to focus what they look at, to focus on what they can see. Then below the window, you've got the different color sheets, different color sheets of paper that you can use to stick things on to help them concentrate. But then they have to discover. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something very interesting. Can you please extend your hand like this and start drawing a circle like this, like this, like this with your hand, moving without stopping. Come on, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Now stop quickly and draw a letter A. To stop and draw the letter A. You had to think, and it, you took a few seconds because you were you were going like naturally round, 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 and suddenly you had to stop and go the other way to go around. This shows all the process that is going in your mind, all uh, all the orders that your brain is sending to the different parts of the body to stop, understand, and draw letter A. Drawing the letters, reading the letters, writing the letters is a very complex thing. And nowadays, um, very often teachers don't teach students how to hold a pencil or a pen. They hold it to develop their personality, they say, any way they like. But the point is that when they don't hold the pencil properly, drawing the letter becomes much more difficult. This is why we have them in fifth or sixth grade, and they take ages to copy or write because they don't know how to draw letters properly, or they have to make a terrible effort to draw them, to write. So um, something very useful is what we call the pencil grip. And I couldn't find the word in Spanish, because if you Google that, they grip the lapises, okay? So the pencil grip is what you can see um, in the slide at the top. Uh, those are plastic things. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's see. I have a problem, Houston. Can you still see the... Can you see the, the slides, please? No? Okay. Let's see. Give me a second, please. Give me a second because we are going on, okay? Here we are, okay. Now, yes. Now we can, you can all see me, right? 
Okay. So uh, we continue. Let's see. Okay, great. We are back. All right. So let me find. Okay, this is what we were talking about. All right. So uh, I was talking about the pencil grips, and there are some special copy books that have bigger lines. So they help students organize their work. Of course, showing letters and how letters make up words using different things, maybe uh, plastic blocks or maybe using Play-Doh uh, or writing on sand, writing on soil, all that helps. Of course, there are some applications. Uh, Apple has got their own applications. Some are for free, others you have to pay for. You may Google that and they are easy, but remember that all applications were not designed for and by Argentinian people. So they are international and uh, so they are not really 100% suitable. There are some applications, there are some programs that allow you, for example, to read and when you read, the program transforms that into a text. Uh, of course, you have to see what you are aiming at. Not all applications are good, definitely not. Another thing you can do, uh, reading comprehension has to do with writing words and making them aware of the value and meaning of each word. So you have to practice writing, especially in the lower forms, writing on different surfaces, on a blackboard or green board, on a white board, on sand, on salt, okay? Playing in this way is going to help them become aware of the word and where a word finishes and how it begins, for example. But above all, when you talk about dyslexia, when you talk about difficult cases without labeling, or when you talk about ADD or children who have attention disorders without labeling, the same as for everything else, the most important thing is to um, pay attention, to listen and to watch out for small signs, simple, subtle signs. Um, we have to pay attention to, for example, boosters. When does the child become more anxious? When does he seem to have more difficulties? Morning, afternoon, Mondays, Fridays, because there are many factors, maybe the child has a booster when he goes to his dad's house because the parents are divorced. So there are so many things that we have to pay attention to. And you may say, well, Ale, but it's not easy. No, I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, I understand the system doesn't help. We say we are walking towards inclusion when we are beginning to just integrate a few children in the classroom and we know much about all this. But we are going in that direction. Now, if you want to start walking, the first thing you have to do is stop, listen carefully, and watch your students very carefully. They will tell you what font they prefer. They will tell you how many sentences they can complete. They will tell you how much time they need, how much more time they need. They will tell you what color they prefer. They give you all this information. And above all, open your heart. Consider that just because they are different, just because they need more time, doesn't mean they can't do it. I've had dyslexic children sitting for basic exercises. Of course, it takes longer. Of course, it takes um, another kind of work. They managed. So everybody can. Uh, technology helps. Yes, it's true. Most books have got digital components and the stories are animated. Of course, that helps. And if in the digital components, among the digital components, you've got interactive activities. Of course, that also helps. But be careful, because technology is not the great solution. I mean, it works every now and then. It works for some things. It works when the child is willing to use the computer. Now, remember the two parallel lines. You have uh, assessment and grading, and also challenging. So the computer solves problems. The computer has got programs that can correct mistakes, that help the child, for example, anticipate the next word. Of course it helps. But at the same time, we have to make them right. We have to help them 
to be able to write, okay? And that's really challenging for us. Now, let's look at a few examples. This is from a first or second grade or even third grade book. This kind of activity, you have it in most workbooks, okay? And uh, they have read a story. You have probably listened to the story, even watched the video. You have, you have worked on the story orally. Now we come to the writing. And here they have to remember the story and complete with actions. And they've got the actions. There are pictures. The first one is swimming. swimming. The second one is playing football. The third one is playing tennis. That's easy. And then they have to remember the story and matching the action with the day on which the different children in the story read it. Uh, sorry, do it. Now, uh, do you think a dyslexic child can do this? Because actually they have to do two things. They have to complete with words that are given there, and they have to draw a line to match. It's easy. Can they do it? I want, now I want to see your answers. Let's see. What do you think? Can they do it as it is? Nobody's answering? Okay, well, I will give you the answer. The answer is no. The answer is no. Okay, here you say great, yes, they can. All right, the answer is no. They have to do it. Too much information, I like that. Yes, there is too much information. They can do it, but one thing at a time. Remember, that is the motto, one thing at a time. So first, I help them and I watch them as they complete the first part. Because what looks easy is easy for, for a child who has no difficulties. For a child who has difficulties, first he has to read a word like rollerblading, baseball, basketball. It's too complicated. Okay, good. No, actually, they, sh they should associate, remember, match too many things. I agree. So we do one thing at a time. And remember that there are six, and six is too much. So perhaps I would tell them to do the first, th the first three. I correct them, then the next three. Once I have corrected the first part and always being near that child who has a problem, patting, saying, well done, go ahead, look, you've done it well, okay? Then I give them time to match, one thing at a time. This is also segmentation. Segmentation is not only cutting out one activity at a time or cutting out one activity on each page. It's not only that. Segmentation is dividing an activity into several parts, okay? So, another, another example from another book. Although this book is for um, schools with a lot of periods of English, uh, this school respects all of this. And it makes, uh, maybe the activity could be guided by the teacher. Okay, yes, well, this is guided because they have pictures and they have uh, the, the words, so it is guided. But they need your personal guide, physical proximity and eye contact. Okay, that kind of guide with feedback. Now, Another activity uh, from another book, uh, this book, although it is for almost bilingual or pseudo bilingual schools, this book has got videos, something they can do. They have to look at exercise number one. They have to watch the video and number the pictures. So again, this one could work. Very good. Okay. So this one works because they only have pictures in the first exercise and the only one, number one is given. They only have to write three numbers. They can do it. Of course, before they do this, I would make them look at the pictures and I would point out the difference so that when they listen, what I'm doing is focusing on the listen. And then the second one is watch the video again and tick, tick or write through a pause or tick across. Perhaps what I would do is make them read the sentence so that then when they have to do it they are really focusing on reading comprehension read first very good excellent comment Pamela. very good yes maybe you could show them the pictures in isolation very good Paula. very good comment so you are understanding now how it works it's not that they cannot do anything they can do a lot of things 
but gradually, slowly, uh, paying attention to their own timing. And to be honest, this way, it works for everybody. So it's not so much that a few are special. I'm helping everybody. Let's go on. Uh, very often when you read about all this, you learn that it's important to get the compromise from the family. If you do that, very often we don't get any compromise, but if you manage to do it, it's good to give them every now and then uh, some extra work, homework, homework so that they become gradually more aware of the word, where a word begins, where it finishes, and for example, in the first one, they learn that it's not the same, because very often to them it's the same. Without getting angry, very slowly, gradually, and the mother will say, ah, oh, but I don't know English, it doesn't matter. The only thing I know is that you should sit next to your child and help him um, in terms of motivation to do them. These exercises help. Then, well, as I was telling you before, uh, these children are dyslexic forever, or they've got the difficulty forever. So even if they get to a first certificate course, this is too much information. So you have to set men, and you have, if possible, uh, one solution could be to cover some parts, and another one would be to use the digital book and project on the screen, you, zooming in and now showing them bigger text and parts of text or highlighting some parts, okay? focusing a little bit more. Um, when it comes to writing, it doesn't matter if the book has got a sample text. It doesn't matter if the book has got exercises to illustrate, for example, the linkers that you expect them to use. It doesn't matter if the text helps them, because first it teaches them to plan and then to write and then to check. This is excellent. But it's not enough. For these children, it's not enough. It's not enough on the one hand because there is too much information. And on the other, because when they come to the writing task, they will find it pretty difficult. So what, you, what do you think you can do? I'm asking you now. Let's see if you've got excellent ideas. No answers? Again, one thing at a time. And when you come to the writing part, one paragraph at a time. At this level, they are writing two or three paragraphs. It's not complete, complete text. Read the text aloud first. Yes, of course. Read the text aloud first and complete the text, the steps, segmentation. You're writing. Very good. Segmentation of the initial text first and checking meaning and understanding. And when you come to the writing task, invent some writing activities that are fun. Yes, okay, that is for general practice. But on the very same day, when you want them to write, when it comes to the actual writing, you would have to monitor very closely paragraph by paragraph. Tell them to write the first part and show it to you and you sit next to them and you provide feedback in a nice way, smiling, ask them to leave a line in between, but segmentation both of the reading of the example and also segmentation of the writing task. They just cannot write a comp composition like this, okay? Unless, of course, they are planning to sit for an exam, and in that case, you have to train them. So, let's go on. Uh, there are many websites that you can consult. There are many places, but play safe. Uh, remember that not everything is true. Remember that not everything is scientific. Remember that not everything is clear. Not everything is for teachers. So these are very interesting and uh, I would say safe and professional websites. This farm is from Argentina and they do a lot of very interesting work. British Dyslexia has a lot of excellent suggestions for parents and teachers and International Dyslexia Association as well. So, uh, these are just websites that you can consult and to show you that um, we need to avoid labels because label, labels just focus on negative aspects. 
We know he's dyslexic, so he cannot write. He is ADD, so he cannot pay attention. I and mean, we always associate with that knows, with that can'ts. And we really have to look at and to pay attention to and to foster the good things, what they can do. These are just a few examples of people who have been, who have become very successful or who were very successful and they were dyslexic. Picasso, Spielberg, Disney, Carrie, Whoopi Goldberg, John Kennedy, George Bush, and the lecturer that I met today, Ruth Hart, is dyslexic. So uh, this doesn't mean that they can't. They can in a different way, with a different tempo. But in the same way, they learn in a different way. We also teach in a different way because when we teach, when we talk about diversity, and this is about diversity, when we talk about diversity, we very often think of that student. But diversity includes the student, yes, also the environment, the context. There are diverse contexts. Teaching in the slums is not the same as teaching in a bilingual school in a very posh neighborhood. Teaching in Salta is not the same as teaching in Santa Cruz. And we are also special as teachers. We are also diverse. We are also different. So that same student with or without problems is going to react in a different way with you, with me, or with my husband. Why? Because we are individual. Because we connect in different ways. Because we transmit different emotions. And we transmit through the word, through body postures, through facial gestures, through the way we contact people. We transmit and transmit and transmit. Everything is diverse, not just the child. So this is why it becomes essential, first of all, to make a decision. If you really want to walk towards inclusion, if you really want to help everybody, then it's very easy and clear that it has to do with tolerance and patience. It has to do with trial and error because there are strategies. But for example, an educational therapist has got more tools than we have, but there are no rules for the tools. There are no rules for the strategies. So that educational therapist who is a professional has to try and see which strategy works. The same as us. So it's a question of trial and error. It's a question of showing that child that we care. And you show it again through your attitude. It has to do with positive reinforcement. It has to do with celebrating that little success, that small thing, that underlining, that writing the capital letter properly, that writing a sentence better than yesterday, those little things. And for that, you need passion. If you are a professional, you can be an excellent teacher, but without this component, without this passion, you are not going to get all the others, the, the tolerance, the care, the positive reinforcement, because you will say, well, I wasn't trained for this. I am just a teacher of English. Or this child should get a psychologist, not a teacher of English. But remember that before being teacher of English, we are educators. And so with passion, we can do many, many things and we can change that child for the better. We can change that life for the better if we avoid frustrations. Uh, we have no right to make a child suffer. That is about everything else. Imagine again that you can be that child's mother or sister. If you were there, you would act in a different way. That is what we have to think. So uh, if you are interested in getting more information, you can always visit our website. Uh, in the Zen link, we've got uh, information in English and in Spanish. At the moment, there are two documents, one generalities and the other one is practical strategies, more or less what we have seen. You can also visit the websites that you have. And uh, there you've got my personal information. That's my email. You can uh, look for me on Facebook also. I do answer your messages. And uh, those of you who need a certificate, please go to Argentina at ELT info. Argentina dot ELT info. 
and there you say who you are and uh, that you want the certificate and we will send you that. So I hope uh, I have just inspired you a little bit to go on. This is not easy, but there's a lot that we can do. We are just beginning to walk towards inclusion. And again, we have no right to frustrate anybody. So let's go on working. I'm sure we can do a lot of things together. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.